Hi everyone, it's Aviva. Um, how y'all doing? I'm getting ready to talk about the Archimedes lab and um, it's going to be, good news, a two-week lab. So you'll be uploading this lab in two weeks to the Canvas website. Um, please include the cover sheet, etc. Um, typing everything up. Um, yeah. Before we begin, before the lab, um, I do need to lecture a little bit. Um, specifically about buoyancy forces. So, um, this material is material that's going to be covered on the next exam because it's force related and if you haven't noticed we've been doing a lot of things with gravitational forces, centripetal forces, and buoyancy forces are going to be included into that mix along with pressure. Um, but buoyancy forces are associated with fluids and most of the time, we're going to assume something called a bulk fluid, which assumes that, um, number one, it's a volume of fluid that we talk about. And then you would be talking about a density that's a volume density in terms of mass. And typically, these are uniform. Frequently, with fluids, uh, we use densities to describe the system instead of masses. It's just kind of a typical terminology. So oftentimes, you'll find that masses get replaced with densities times volume. So, for instance, if you have a mass of a fluid, you would need to know the density of the fluid that you're talking about and the volume of the fluid that you had. <clears throat> so densities are definitely going to be something that we're kind of referring to here, as well as buoyancy forces. So let's talk a little bit about the buoyancy force. And uh, this is something that Archimedes used, and it was Archimedes' principle that talked about buoyancy forces. In fact, Archimedes' principle said that for every body submerged in a fluid, so let's make a nice fluid. So here's a fluid. And this is going to be a still fluid for the purposes of our discussion, meaning it's not moving. But he said for every body that's immersed in a stool fluid, that there's an upward pointing force that buoys it up, and that's the buoyancy force. Now, the net force on the object could cause it to go up or down. So let's say here's an object. Archimedes says that there will be a net force of buoyancy. Oops, spelled that wrong. <laughs> net force of buoyancy that points upward. Now there's, you know, other forces like the weight of the object, so on and so forth, mass of the object times g, but the buoyancy force, net force is upward. But his postulation was that the buoyancy force, which I'll just call b here, was equal to the weight of the fluid that was displaced. by the object being submerged there. Uh, here was his argument. So again, let's say you look at some kind of still fluid. And that's do it. Fluid is of density rho sub f. 
that's known density in this case. And you look at this fluid and, you know, I'm anticipating that I'm going to put something like a bowling ball. Uh, I guess this would be like a bowling ball type of round object that I'm about to submerge in the fluid. But I haven't done it yet. And I'm just going to look at the region where I'm going to submerge it. Right, so this is kind of a cutout of the volume of the fluid that I'm going to displace by putting my bowling ball there. And then if I say that my system is this kind of cutout of fluid, right, so So here's my system, and I think about all the forces acting on the system. Well, you would say that my system is in contact with the fluid. In fact, contact forces are all around it from the surrounding fluid. So you have a fluid force of contact here, here, here here, here. These are all contact forces, and you can imagine that um, this is more like a pin cushion surrounding it, that there's forces in all three dimensions acting on this spherical shape. But these are all forces of contact from the surrounding fluid. And there would also be gravity. So why don't I make gravity? And just make it red and uh, this would be just mg but of course this is the mass of the fluid I'm about to cut out in a second because that's my system the argument is because this is a still fluid that you say the sum of forces equals to zero and you know all of the forces equal to zero well if you add up all of the contact surrounding fluid forces, what you're going to find is that it has to point net upward to counteract gravity. If we're arguing that the sum of forces in the zero are y, then the net force of all the surrounding fluid must point up, and the argument for that it's because gravity points down. Now, typically though, we're gonna call that net force of the surrounding fluid the buoyancy force B. Okay, so this relationship is where we say that the contact force of the surrounding fluid is just equal to the mass of the fluid that you're about to displace times g. This is its weight. And this just comes from the fact that in order for the fluid to be still, this must be the case. So when you do finally, you know, put your system here, put it, put your object inside the fluid. The argument is, is that, you know, your buoyancy force is still there. The surrounding fluid hasn't changed. Um, it's just now your system, which is this object, has a different weight acting on it. And depending on that, it can go up or down or stay the same, depending on the mass of the object itself. If this was a bowling ball in water, the mass, the weight of the object, would be larger than the buoyancy force, and it would probably move downward. If this was styrofoam in water, it would move up. So using these ideas, Archimedes' principle said that the buoyancy force is equal to the weight of the fluid that you're about to displace 
or mg. Now, I told you that we tend to replace m's with densities times volume. And so if you're talking about the mass of the fluid you're going to displace, the density in question would be the density of the fluid, and the volume in question would be the volume you're displacing. And so generally speaking, you'll see the buoyancy force written as the density of the fluid, the volume displaced by the object that you are inserting in the fluid, times g. And this equation we will be using frequently. Kind of a standard example of buoyancy forces is just saying, OK, um, if you do have something completely submerged in a fluid, you might ask, uh, does, does the object sink or swim? So uh, again, let me put oops. <laughs> That's not particularly good. Let's try that again. Ooh better. So let's say I do put a, I do put a, f a mass inside of a fluid. And you say that due to contact, there's a buoyancy force acting on the system pointing net force upward. And there's also weight or the force of gravity acting on this object. And you might ask yourself, what dictates whether this thing sinks or swims? Or more specifically, does it sink, stay, or swim? Well, there's only forces in the Y. And when I say sink, I mean it's going downward. When I say swim, it's going upward. And when I say stay, that means the sum of forces are zero. It's not moving anywhere. So uh, if I call this the positive y hat direction, what I mean is that the sum of forces in the y, in order to sink, will be negative. To stay is still zero. And to swim is going to be overall positive. Um, it turns out the density has a big role in this. So uh, let's take a look. The sum of forces in the y equals b minus the mass of the object times g. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite the density as the density of the fluid times the volume displaced times g. And kind of true to form, I'm going to replace mass with density times volume, specifically here for the mass of the object. And in fact, the mass of the object will just be whatever the density of the object is times whatever the volume of the object is, uh, all times g. It's at this time I, I ask myself the question, how much volume is displaced here? The answer to that question is typically associated with, is it the mass completely or is it partially submerged? If it's completely submerged, then the volume displaced is just equal to the volume of the object. If it's partially submerged, the volume displaced is less than the volume of the object maybe one half, a third. Um, typically, you could say the volume displaced equals to n times the volume of the object, where n is only allowed to be between 0 and 1, and that will cover all cases. But the most the volume displaced can be is equal to the volume of the object. Uh, that's our case here. Uh, the volume displaced is equal to the volume of the object, and so I can re rewrite the sum of forces in the y as the density of the fluid, the volume of the object, again, because it's completely submerged, 
times g minus the density of the object volume of the object times g. And it's at this point I'm like, oh, okay, let me just pull out the volume of the object. And gravity, so I can see really what is the thing that makes this positive, negative, or zero is this difference between densities. So if the density of the fluid is greater than the density of the object, this is positive, and the system swims. It, it goes to the surface. So something that was submerged will then rise up. Its net force is greater than zero. It goes in the positive y. An example of that is uh, an easy one is maybe if the density of the object is uh, styrofoam. That has units of about 300 kilograms per meter cubed. And density of the fluid, let's say I put it in water, that's about 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed in SI units. And this is a case where we always see styrofoam independent of the volume of the styrofoam will always rise in water. It's really the densities that determine these things. Uh, another example is, you know, if you happen to have an object that's exactly the density of the fluid, then the sum of forces in the y are going to be zero, and it's just going to stay there if it was already still. A lot of times, human beings are like that. The density, are, the density of the object, if the density of the fluid is water, well, then our density is very similar to the density of water. Um, in fact, when we take air in our lungs or expel it, we can change our density a little bit by changing our volume, but not changing our mass. So we can kind of, in a swimming pool, by intaking or releasing air, we can rise or sink or stay if we make our density exactly the same as water. Interesting. Similarly, if the density of the fluid is less than the density, oops, the density of the object, then overall this is going to be negative and the system is going to sink down to the bottom. So the net force on the system will be negative, and it will accelerate down. You know, if the density of fluid is water, and the density of the object is like a metal, you know, which maybe is around 3,000 kilograms per meter cubed, 8,000 kilograms per meter cubed, again, we always see metal sinks in water. And it's because of the density, not the volume. Okay, so it's kind of an example of playing with buoyancy and trying to understand that it's really the density of the object that determines whether or not it sinks or stays or swims in a fluid. Okay, so maybe that's enough playing around with buoyancy for now. We'll be coming back to buoyancy forces and using them a lot. Um, I just, again, important to remember that um, the buoyancy fort is the weight of the fluid that's being displaced. So, buoyancy force, weight of the fluid displaced. We also remember that volume displaced depends on How much is submerged? Okay, so let's move on and talk about the lab a little bit now. Let me read to you the, well, I'll summarize the first paragraph of the lab to you. This is something about um, 
King Hiero the second around the time of 250 BC. Um, he was a king, and he had a scientist who was Archimedes. And the king hired Archimedes because he had made or given a bunch of gold uh, to somebody to make him a crown. I suppose we should make it yellow. There we go. Anyhow, uh, back in the day, they measured densities. Oops. They measured densities by just looking at mass over volume. You know, they could uh, they could measure masses because they had scales, um, almost like our triple beam balance. So they were pretty good at measuring masses, but volumes were more complicated. So uh, volumes they could measure uh, if they were simple geometries. You know, cubes, maybe a sphere. But for something like a crown, uh, it has a hard to measure volume. Now, this matters because the king thought that he had been swindled. And in order to see if his crown was the same density as gold, um, he would have to know the mass of the crown divided by the volume of the crown. But if he doesn't know this well, doesn't know the volume well, then the density of the crown could easily vary. vary. And he would never know if he had been swindled. And some, that guy had taken some of his gold and replaced it with you know, tin or aluminum, something to make an alloy. So he asked Archimedes, he said, Archimedes, <laughs> how do I find the density of an object? Oops, sorry. Without knowing its volume. And Archimedes buoyancy forces. To do this. And uh, he derived this relationship. He said, you can find the density of an object in terms of the density of a fluid that's known. So like water. Water is one gram per centimeter cubed or 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. It was a known density. In fact, it was really a reference density. Um, anyhow, if you know the density of a fluid, like water, and if you can find the mass of the object uh, in air, regular mass, if you can then divide it by its buoyant mass in that fluid, this equation, which incidentally is your theory section number one, can give you the density of an object without knowing its volume. So um, again, this is just an object's mass in air. Uh, this is something called the buoyant mass in a fluid. Uh, in the known fluid. So we came up with this relationship. Let me just draw you a picture of those two things. Say so you have a scale. And you know, it gives you a reading. It could give you force, but let's say it gives you a reading in mass. 
So maybe at the end of this thing, I'm hanging an object. Oof. If you're hanging this mass and it's just sitting there in air, then, you know, ultimately, this scale is just reading the tension in the string. Right? And the tension in the string is equal and opposite to the weight of the object. And so it's giving you back just the weight of the object in air. <clears throat> uh, this is the same mass of the object that's in our equation. That's what the reading gives you. However, if you take the same scale and you take the object oof, <laughs> But now you submerge it into a fluid of known density, like water. Close. <clears throat> um, what the scale is actually reading is lighter than the mass of the object. And in fact, a lot of times we say that this is the buoyant mass in that fluid. Again, uh, this comes from the idea that uh, there's now an extra force acting on the system. You have a force of buoyancy now. So you don't just have tension anymore you have tension, you still have, you know, tension, you still have the weight of the object, but now in addition you have this buoyancy force acting on the system. And so the scales are reading something a little bit lighter. So you're going to be taking these two measurements using the Archimedes lab. We have something called the triple beam balance, which I will be showing you in a short video after this. And yeah, it's a scale, same thing. We're gonna be hanging masses from it, uh, measuring it in air and measuring their buoyant mass in different fluids, um, but mostly with water. Um, so in fact, we're going to have, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five different objects that we're gonna be doing the above measurements for. One of them is more complicated, so I'm going to keep that one separate. Because one of them is wood, and the density of the wood is less than the density of the water that we're going to be looking at. And so it wants to float. <laughs> and so we have to find a way to deal with it. The remaining four objects, the density of the object is greater than the density of the water we're going to be submerging them in. And so they'll sink. Anyhow, for those, we're literally going to be doing those two measurements above, putting them in water and measuring their mass in air. And as long as we know the density of the water, let me just remind you, as long as we know the density of the water, right, we just plug things into this equation. So, um, if we're using water here, we can say that this is 1,000 kilograms per meters cubed. In fact, the lab actually asks you to use one gram per centimeter cubed, so not the SI unit. So let me erase that. Um, we're going to use one gram per centimeter cubed, and you're going to assume that this is exact in the lab. It tells you that. Uh, and then you'll just be measuring the mass of the object in air. 
and then the mass of the object that's buoyant mass, in this case, in water. Um, your four objects you're going to do that for are going to be lead, brass, some unknown that you have no idea what it is, and this bolt that's sitting out there. The bolt you also don't know what it's made out of either. Same with the unknown. But you're going to be trying to determine what they are. So you have lead and brass. Those you should be able to kind of right away after you plug in your values, check the reference density and, and see does that make sense. So uh, in table one in the lab, you'll see it asks for the mass and then it asks for the buoyant mass uh, in water for all four of those objects in the table. Okay, it's going to ask for all of those and then it's going to have kind of a third column that's <laughs> I did not plan this well, but it's change in mass. And that's just uh, really just this denominator. Ugh, let me start this over, sorry. So your table one is going to look something like this. Mass of the object, buoyant mass in water, and then change in mass. And so for your first four values, you'll Enter those in. <clears throat> and the change in mass is really just going to be mass of the object minus the buoyant mass in water. So it's just what's in the denominator here, right? It's just this. That's the change in mass. And that's it. You'll be recording those. So you have lead, brass, unknown, and bolt. The table goes on a little bit because it also has a place for wood and NaCl. So um, you don't know it, but you're also going to be finding the density of an object that floats. I mentioned that, but you're also going to be finding the density of a fluid, of an unknown fluid using the same principles. So we have these first four covered. That leaves these last two that we have to deal with. Because once you have their buoyant mass and the mass of the object, you're able just to plug it into that equation and spit out some densities. And in table two, you will be presenting those with their calculated uncertainties. <clears throat> So before we move on, you will be asked to show a sample calculation of the density of the object um, using your measured values. And then you're going to be asked to propagate the error. You would have measured mass of the object and the buoyant mass and fluid one time, but you'll have an uncertainty given by the precision of the triple beam balance, 0.01 grams, you'll be able to propagate in that equation. So again, you'll be taking partial derivatives, etc., to find the uncertainty in the density of the object. And you will also show a sample calculation of this. And then in table two, you'll re be reporting your densities with their uncertainties. You'll also be asked to look up reference densities. So since uh, you know one of them is lead, you'll look up the density of lead. Brass is a different story. The unknown, you'll just be trying to determine what is it. So whatever you think it is, that will become the reference density. Same thing for the bolt. It'll be like, what is it? What is it made out of? The most complicated case, though, is going to be brass for the reference density. So brass uh, is an alloy, 
that means that it can have a range of densities. Is it yellow brass, copper brass, blah, 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 a bunch. But because of that, for the reference density of brass, we're going to ask you to actually calculate the mass over volume. So this kind of goes against the lab because the lab is about finding what is the density of the object without knowing its volume. But because we have a hard time doing that, um, we're going to ask you to calculate the volume of the brass by measuring its length, width, and height five times each, averaging that, etc., etc. I think you guys know that drill. It's a, it's a block, a cubic shape. Okay, so for the brass, that one's a little bit different. You'll look up everything else, but for the brass, you're actually going to have to calculate its volume too. But for the lead, you'll look it up. For the bolt and the unknown, you'll be looking those up. That leaves the wood. So the wood is a little bit different because it, it wants to swim or, or rise to the top. So what we do, instead of having um, a single mass on our scale, uh, what we're going to do is to measure, is to couple it to a larger mass. So let's say we take the brass mass and we attach it to the wood block. Um, if we do that, um, it will completely submerge in the fluid. But what I'm going to do, um, this is going to be, whew, that was interesting. This is going to be water. So first I'm going to submerge only the brass mass. This is going to be called M1 whatever the scale reads, the mass with only one of them submerged. Um, it's also called a reading one in the lab manual. The second reading that you're going to do is with both the wood and the brass submerged in the water. Um, this will be M2 or reading two according to the lab manual. In addition to that, you'll also be measuring just the mass of the wood itself. So again, if I have the scale, I'll also set it up where it's just the wood in air. And this will just be just the mass of the wood itself. So really, I'm taking three readings for this wood part here. Three readings. M1, M2, M1, M2, and MW. Um, I should say though, for the wood, we do ask that you measure MW twice. Once, before it's submerged and it's not wet, and once after it's submerged and it is wet, because it does absorb a little bit of water and there's an error there, so we ask you to measure it twice and to average it out and then use that value in your calculations. So, <clears throat> How do you find the density of the wood, you say? Well, it's a very similar equation uh, to what we used before. It's just you're going to be using your three readings with it. MW, M1, and M2, along with the density of the fluid. So this is your theory section number two that you have to derive. Um, the density of your fluid is just going to be the density of water. Again, one gram per centimeter cubed. 
But MW, M1 and M2, you'll be measuring and recording those. And then you'll be calculating the density of the wood and trying to determine what kind of wood it is by looking it up. Um, as a reference density for the wood, you're going to be doing the same thing that you did with the brass. Uh, you will try to determine what the wood is made out of, but as a reference density, you're going to calculate the volume and look at mass over volume just as reference. It would be nice to know what species it is, though, and perform a percent error against that. Okay, last part of this lab is um, finding the density of aqueous NaCl, so uh, of salt water. So we've been finding the density of all these objects, but you can also use Archimedes' principle to determine the density of a fluid that you don't know. So we're going to assume that uh, we don't know the density of NaCl, that it's unknown of aqueous NaCl, salt water. Uh, this is going to be the completely saturated case. And we've written the reference density for you already in the lab. Uh, you'll see it here. But you're going to be calculating on your own in another way. And in fact, um, what you're going to be doing is taking any one of your masses. Let's say we take the lead mass. So let's take the lead mass. We've already measured the mass of the lead in air. But in addition to that, we're going to take the scale and we're going to take the lead mass, or whichever mass you would happen to choose, and we're going to put it in the salt water. Oops. What color is salt water? Let's go with uh, orange. <laughs> so this is the aqueous NaCl. that you've submerged this in, and you're gonna get a reading from this too. Um, this will be, honestly, it's just a, a buoyant mass, but instead of in water, it's in NaCl. So this is your new reading. You're gonna use the mass of the object in air you're going to use this new buoyant mass in NaCl, but you're going to use also your buoyant mass in water to determine the density of the aqueous NaCl. So you're going to want to derive this equation. Also, This equation is your theory section number three. You have to derive it. But once you do, all you're going to need is to know the density of water, which you already know. Uh, the buoyant mass, did we say of the lead? Okay, so the buoyant mass of the lead in salt water the buoyant mass of the lead in water, and just the mass of the lead in air on its own. And you'll be able to term, determine the density of aqueous NaCl, and you'll compare it to the reference density. Um, and you'll calculate a percent error. So there's lots of little bits in this lab um, that ask for propagation of air. So you're going to be propagating error in just about everything that you do in this lab for all the densities. So get ready for that. There's a little bit of time 
in this lab because of the theory sections and all of the propagation. But um, we have two weeks for it, so that's fantastic. You'll also notice that at the very end of the lab, there's a lab extra credit. So I'm going to ask that you turn that in, due in one week. So after you turn that in, I'm going to give you 5% back towards any lab. So I'll be arranging a place to turn that in in the 205 lab canvas shells. Um, <clears throat> It'll be due in one week from your recitation. So I'll be setting that up there. Okay, so please, after you watch this video, please watch the, the lab portion where I walk to the lab and I show you the actual apparatus and everything. Okay, that takes about five to ten minutes, but there's one already for you. All right, so we should be all set to do this lab, uh, potentially next week. Um, maybe we'll be talking more about buoyancy forces or wrapping anything up with the lab. I'll be getting back to you on that. Okay, two-week lab, you guys. All right, good, good stuff. Talk to you soon. Bye.